Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. We're all back in our respective places, no longer traveling and on the road. So we've got an exciting program <laughs> for you today. We're going to be talking, uh, kind of responding to this new documentary slash film that's coming out called Cessationism. They've got a lot of one-liners in that too, so it's going to be exciting to respond to all of those things today. You stay tuned, it's going to be an exciting episode. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. We've got an exciting episode that many of you have already kind of seen, the thumbnail, the graphic. Uh, the, you might be saying, why is Josh burning down this thing? It's part of their logo. It was just, it was like already in flames. And I just really enjoyed the idea of just helping it along. Let's go ahead and burn, burn cessationism to the ground. No, but seriously, today in our video, we're going to be responding to this new film called Cessationism. There's a lot of claims in the promo uh, that, frankly, it's a promo. Lots of promos aren't trying to make really well-crafted arguments, but these one-liners just really got under our skin, so we wanted to respond to it. I'm sure that the, the, the full film is going to be more balanced. It's going to have a lot of theological arguments that are a little bit more sound, a little bit more robust, that have some more airbags on them. But, but for our discussion today, we're going to respond to what's been released. So you guys stay tuned for that. But I want to remind you, Remnant Radio is an entirely crowdfunded ministry. So if you're you're here and you're loving our content, you want to support the channel, there are links in the description. You can give a one-time gift on PayPal or a reoccurring gift on Patreon. If you give on Patreon, it's five bucks a month, you get access to extra content. Uh, speaking of extra content, one of the things that we've released recently is the Word and Spirit School of Ministry. If you want to get discipled in spiritual gifts, you want to learn how to practice the gifts and get some time with me, Michael, Michael and Elijah, uh, we will kind of walk you through this. It's a great program where you watch 117 videos, you do questions and answers, and then you come to live Q&A with us once a week. Uh, it's a great course that's developed and designed to help you grow in your knowledge of God's Word and the power of God's Spirit. If that's something that's interesting to you, check the links of the description. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to the gentleman's, the gentleman and Roundtree. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, Michael. <laughs> uh, we I'm not a gentleman or I'm not a the gentleman. The gentleman and the genteel man. There it is. Uh, nice. Miller's internet looks like it just froze him. So I'm tossing it to Roundtree. Roundtree, tell us about your week. Uh, you got you got done anointed this by is, this some, is some actually scholars. I did get anointed by a few scholars, which was pretty special. Um, yeah, so it's official. I am the new lead pastor of preaching and vision at Bridgeway Church. So that's really cool. So uh, Sam Storms just retired on Sunday officially, and on Sunday I was anointed. And a couple of uh, a couple of guys were in town, three to be exact. Uh, John Piper, he preached that Sunday, and uh, Jack Deere, who's a mentor, spiritual father to me, and uh, Mike Bickle, who leads the International House of Prayer, were also there. And and we had a whole bunch of weekend festivities honoring Sam for an incredible forty eight years of ministry. Uh, but uh, at the tail end of that, I I got anointed as the new new lead pastor. So. Um, Felt really special and honored by the church, but also by the Lord to send us uh, those three guys and then to be uh, stepping into this position. It's uh, yeah, it's a you real said honor. you said three guys, and I was really excited for you to bring up myself, Elijah Stevens, and Michael Miller. But then you were like uh, Piper, Bickle, and uh, you know Sam Storms, <laughs> Jack Deere, and I was just like, ouch, uh, deeply wounded. Uh, actually, on that note, Miller. Actually, uh, I was, I was really in the happy basement. That you were there. I, I mean, I got out of there as fast as I could Sunday morning, so I wouldn't have to endure. <laughs> oh, <everything. laughs> it's actually true. Yeah, Miller. <laughs> Miller was in town the whole week. We were filming. By the way, we were filming some awesome episodes. We got a, a series called Spooky Evangelism that's going to come out around October uh, once the Kansas City Prophets in. So we were all in town. Uh, we were doing that, and we were there for Sam also. And uh, but Miller had to head back to his church and preach and miss my whole anointing. Thanks, bro. That's really a cool friend. Well, well, I wouldn't have say have I've an missed anointing. It there, to miss <laughs> 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 okay, you guys. All right, you guys. You Should guys we talk about the content, or are we going to keep ripping each other? I don't know. I think Dude, mine was the best so far. Bad. <laughs> here's what's bad, Miller. Josh went to my former church, Wellspring Church, and he preached there, and he ribbed on me. 
while I wasn't even there. Like, <laughs> yeah. behind my back to the church. Well played. My well opening played, line, and, and my you know opening what he did? line called- as I preach was, I have never seen this church so full. I cannot <laughs> wait to tell Michael Roundtree that he had to leave before the church could grow. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's actually a huge blessing, to be honest. I'm so glad that it's continuing to flourish. Amen. Interpret it a, a good any way you want to, Michael. Really, really the Lord. <laughs> yeah, that and I needed to leave. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, so let's talk about cessationism. So yeah. uh, where do we want to start this conversation out, fellas? Um, you know, I think that, that we probably should be gracious. You know, people are going to make promo clips, promo videos based off of the most catchy slash incendiary thing that possibly could be said because it draws people's attention and it it sticks in their imagination. So when we're watching this, there are straw man arguments everywhere. Um, And I want to be gracious and hopeful that uh, this video, this movie, the series that comes out, I'm going to watch it. I hope our audience watches it as well. Um, I hope that there are going to be more thoughtful cessationist arguments given because Literally everything in the promo has been something we've responded to in the past. They're just straw man arguments. They're very weak. They don't really engage with the continuationist position at all. And uh, yeah, so uh, I'm I'm looking forward to it. But I do think that we need to be gracious coming into the conversation. Uh, just assuming it was a promo clip. You know, the the real catchy, edgy stuff goes in the promo clip. So, uh, <laughs> Josh, I love that you're like, we need to be gracious, but this was terrible. It, I mean, well, uh, hot garbage is more of an accurate description. But. Okay. So, so, so hold on a second. The <laughs> promo clip also has every quote taken out of its context and put there. Granted, right. they're showing a promotion to catch people's attention. So these clips that they have taken out of context are actually on them for taking it out of context. And so we're going to address each of those little one-liners that they gave uh, and, and show you why this is actually not good scholarship. Yeah, yeah. And it's also a good reminder to say that if you're watching this, realize that they're not making these arguments in a vacuum. It's probably because there is a hyper charismatic church movement uh, that is certainly on the fringes, but that's growing and that is dangerous and that is wildly out of control. And they're responding to them because they have TV stations, right? They have tons of television airtime and they have YouTube and they're growing on the Elijah list. I mean, there's just massive charismatic spaces that are that are wildly out of control and they are responding i think to that specific group more than they are you know the da carsons the sam storms the craig keeners the wayne grudems the the the, the jp morelands the uh absolutely Jesus, ben witherington Dude. the third on and yeah. on and in fact we we actually made a list this is if you're watching this and you made the cessationist uh documentary and maybe you're still making it it hasn't been released yet so i assume there's still time to make some edits I would encourage you, you need to interact with the best of the continu- continuationist movement, not the very worst. Like, if you get footage of a bunch of crazy charismatics doing wild and crazy things inside of a meeting and say, ah, see, they're all terrible. Well, that's not really actually doing your homework. I mean, why are you going to make a documentary and focus on the very worst and then characterize the entire thing that way? It's dishonest and it's unhelpful and it's actually harmful to the body of Christ. Uh, the charismatic movement is the fastest growing movement. Uh, I don't know. I've, I've read before that the charismatic Pentecostal movement is the fastest growing, largest volunteer movement in human history. Um, I can't remember which missiologist said that. But uh, anyway, I've read it before. But here's a list of names that we would appeal to you to uh, include in your documentary, either themselves, interview them, or their their writings. But here you go. D.A. Carson, Craig Keener, all of these are doctors, so I'm just not even going to bother saying it. Uh, Jack Deere, Sam Storms, Ben Witherington, Amos Young, R.T. Kendall, uh, Dr. Gordon Fee, uh, Wayne Grudem, David N. Stone Brewer, N.T. Wright, Scott McKnight, JP Moreland. I mean, we could keep going uh, because the tides kind of turned. Cessationism is actually dying. Charismaticism is growing because guess what? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the, all of the ends of the earth. Guess what? It's happening. And uh, this is why the movement is growing so rapidly. And uh, nobody wants to go to church to hear about what God's not doing. And that's what cessationism does. So yeah. uh, actually, in engage with these scholars 
And if you engage with their real arguments, then you know what? We might say, okay, this is this is actually a helpful corrective. Like, take Josh, for instance, uh, when you and I watched American Gospel, we were kind of like, you know, it's not like I agree with everything, but I kind of like the movie. It's got some good, uh, you, you know, I think it did have a cessationist, I mean, it, it's it comes from a cessationist point of view, but I, I thought it was a pretty good movie, didn't didn't you, Josh? Yeah, I like Brandon Kimber. Uh, I, I would I'd consider him a, a a friend. We've spoken on the phone multiple times. Uh, he interviewed me and Matthew Tarpley for the third docu series that they have. Um, I speak highly of Brandon. I like Brandon. I think uh, he's a genuinely uh, honest documentary uh, guy who, who produces great content. The video on moral therapeutic deism, um, which is prime eighty percent of the American gospel film, was not cessationist leaning. It was moral therapeutic deism and a lot of the charismatic guys got lumped into that that group uh ben, benny hen kenneth copeland todd white um and though there are some assessments that i disagreed with i think the vast majority of the film i say yes and amen like we don't need to be preaching a do more be better pull yourself by, up by your bootstraps mm-hmm. gospel we need to preach faith and repentance christ alone crucified the solas uh so yes and amen to that his second film on atonement theory uh, we wanted to review it, but it would have just been an hour. It would be really boring. It'd been an hour of us saying, yes, that is correct. Um, there was like no reason for us to respond. We needed a little more to disagree with. Yeah, but we you guys can go. You guys can with. go back and watch. We reviewed American Gospel like two years ago or something yeah. like that. But uh, our point is just simply just simply do your homework. All right. So uh, I'm going to read this quote, Miller. I want to hear from you over there in the uh, in the basement of Denver. So um, I'm going to read this quote. And then why don't you start us out on a response to it? This is from the documentary Cessationist. If someone has the miraculous gift of healing, surely all he needs to do is to prove it. But let's face it. We've oh, been wait, battling. With Michael, COVID. do you want to watch the whole video? I yeah, have the video, yeah. Michael. And then yeah, we'll just respond to each of the quotes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. let's do that. Three, two, one, go. If somebody has the gift of miraculous healing, surely all he needs to do is to prove it but let's face it we've been battling with covid and the so-called miracle workers went into hiding together with us cessationism is the view that certain miraculous gifts that stood as signs of an apostle speaking in tongues healing prophecies interpretation of tongues gifts like that ceased with the apostles Cessationism has fallen out of favor because commitment to the authority of Scripture has fallen out of favor. When you turn on Christian TV, you don't see expositors of Scripture. John MacArthur or Steve Lawson. You see Joel Osteen, Joseph Prince, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, Joyce Meyer, Paula White. That's who you see because that's the mainstream. Speaking in tongues, you're going to speak out of your spirit. Don't worry about what it sounds like. Our understanding of speaking in tongues must be guided by the scriptures, not our feelings. They were known languages that were capable of interpretation, and not everybody speaks in tongues. If God speaks, it must be infallible, inerrant, and authoritative. And the Lord said to me, will you howl for me? I said, don't ask me to do that, Lord. There's no longer the need for the gift of prophecy speaking forth divine revelation from God. We have now the whole counsel of God. This word is the final word. The apostolic gifts have gone. They were never intended for our generation. We have everything that we need from the Holy Spirit today. It's hard to get anyone who's gone through that to come back and take a serious look at faith in Christ focused on the gospel rather than focused on these phony miracles. Well, that's the video for the Kickstarter. So you kind of know, okay, Again, one-liners, you've heard us, if you've watched Internet Radio for any extended period of time, 
almost all of those arguments we have engaged with very uh, intentionally. So uh, Roundtree, I'll just toss it over to you. You wanted to engage with that first one. It's one that we did at the top of our last episode. So let's run through it pretty quickly. Okay, so you're talking about the, the Conrad uh, quote, if someone has a miraculous gift of healing, surely all we need, he needs to do is prove it? Yep, that's is the that, one. Empty yeah, out that sure. hospital, Michael. Gosh, uh, cool. Well, I'm glad you weren't in Nazareth when Jesus went there, and Mark chapter 6 says Jesus could not do many miracles there <laughs> because of their unbelief. Would you just say, man, well, I guess if you just lived in Nazareth and that's all you knew and you saw Jesus come through, would you just say, well... Um, I guess I guess this isn't a thing because he prayed for this person and that person and it didn't work out. Or what about the disciples when they pray over the little boy and they couldn't heal him? And Jesus says, well, uh, he points out their lack of faith as well as their need for prayer. Uh, would you say they're just, you know, God just wasn't doing anything? Or what about in the days of Samuel when it says that visions in those days were rare because of the judgment that was over the land? Or Psalm 74, 9, where it says, uh, I think I have it here. Well, I don't. But uh Anyway, to Psalm 74, 9, it says, you know, we, we have no signs, we have no prophets, none of us knows how long this will be. And, and these cases, uh, specifically Psalm 74, as well as 1 Samuel 3, there was a judgment over the land, and that actually caused there to be a diminishing of the number of signs, wonders, miracles, and those kinds of phenomena. Uh, I would look at, gosh, there's, there's so much going on here. I mean, <laughs> if we look at the Church of the West, if we look at specifically the Church in America, um, I think America is under judgment, and Romans chapter 1 makes that clear. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And, and he goes on, he talks about God handing us over to our sins so that our in our morality we're you know given to sexual insanity and homosexuality and celebrating it. Well, that's exactly what's happening in our nation, a.k.a. America's under judgment. That's what Romans chapter 1 is telling us. And so if if we look at America, this, this land... Uh, that is experiencing the wrath of God being handed over to our moral insanity. And we say, well, there's not enough signs and wonders here for me to believe. I'm like, well, um, have you traveled the world a little bit? I haven't talked to a missionary that hadn't seen signs and wonders on a massive scale. Well, I won't say massive scale, but I, I, haven't, I haven't talked to one who hadn't seen them. Are you going to talk to the 40% of Muslims who are having dreams and coming to Jesus as a result of the dreams? Are you going to be about like the cessationist I know who convinced someone who was saved because of a dream of Jesus appearing to her said, well, maybe it was the devil? Are you going to turn that crazy? What are you going to say about Paul living uh, who who had incredible healing power and uh, who moved in incredible healing power. But uh, Timothy tells him to take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Are you going to use the lame cessationist argument that Paul had less healing power at the end of his life? What are you going to do it about Acts chapter 28 when an entire island of natives is healed of their diseases? And when Paul shakes off a deadly viper from his hand, are you going to use the lame argument that Paul lost healing power at the end of his life? That's crazy talk. What are you going to do with the first 400 years of church history? When uh, signs and wonders abounded, I would agree that there was a uh, there's an ebb and flow in church history, and uh, just like there is with revival. And uh, after the Constantine declared, you know, Christianity was the official Roman religion, it, that changed a lot, and it it did seem like miracles were less, but they were never gone. There were visions, and there were healings, and there were miracles all throughout church history. What do you do with those? And what do you do with Craig Keener's book? Uh, have you read Craig Keener's book, Miracles Today? You cannot read it and come Michael, away thinking I, I wanna, this is a bunch of I want to give you a hogwash. slight correction. You said book as if there was just one. These are the two volumes yeah. of books, books plural, that he put together documenting modern day miracles. Absolutely. So, I, I mean, just because you haven't experienced it, James chapter 4, you ask, you, you, <laughs> Uh, you receive not because you ask not, you have not because you ask not. Okay, well, how many times have you prayed for a healing? Probably not a whole lot because you don't believe in it. I've prayed for a lot of healing. I've seen a fair amount of healing. My wife was healed of glaucoma, and the doctor said that you can't be healed of glaucoma. I prayed for her for 10 years straight, every single day, twice, and she was finally healed this May. Okay, or maybe it was <laughs> April. But, Bro, someone just said, put ice on that man. He's on fire. Um, <laughs> I, I, Sorry, I, I should give off. you guys a chance to talk, but I'm just but, like, this is no, such a bad argument. That's the, that's just... the argument. The argument is if you had the gift of healing, you can do it on the command. And yet 
the Apostle Paul, the very beginning of his ministry in Galatia, could he had some kind of infirmity. They still received him. He left Epaphroditus at Miletus sick. Uh, Trophimus was on his deathbed before God raised him up. I'm sorry, Trophimus was left at Miletus sick, and Epaphroditus was on his deathbed before God raised him up. I'm switching those. Uh, like you said, he didn't heal Timothy, uh, but we have these stories of them sending handkerchiefs and performing these miracles. So uh, there is a, a problem with this idea that, well, you can heal everyone on command if you have the gift of healing. That is an eisegetical argument that is being read into the text that the scriptures never explicitly sedate. In fact, the, the, the first Corinthians chapter 12 says that there are various gifts of healings, plural. Uh, and there has been no small amount of ink that has been shed by guys like, uh, 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 Gordon Fee, Sam Storms, Jack Deere, Wayne Grudem on that very idea that there are people who have various gifts of healings, plural, uh, and that those things don't work on command any more than uh, the evangelists can save souls on command. There's a cooperative work with God when praying, asking, preaching. There's a co-laboring that takes place, and God is sovereign. He gets to perform things as he wills. So, Right, uh, which they, that also brings up even like, even the first Corinthians 12 mention of gifts, technically gifts of healings. Um, there are multiple perspectives on that. And some view gifts of healing, not as something that say like I permanently possess, uh, like maybe say the gift of teaching or, uh, or something like that. But, uh, which, so some would call that, like say the gift of teaching a residential gift versus an occasional gift, like healings or miracles. God, whenever God gives it, it's a gift in that moment. Uh, I'm not necessarily weighing in on that debate, but it's a debate worth having. And, uh, and and the reason that debate is even there is because even exactly what you said, Josh, even in the New Testament, while Jesus, say, could teach on command, uh, even he couldn't heal on command. Uh, he operated... At, he operated in cooperation with the Holy Spirit in Mark chapter 6. He could not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. And, and it gets into us a weird area. I think there are people in the comment section. I'm going to toss it over to Miller. He's like, hey, guys, I'm here too. Uh, be careful <laughs> in, in accusing Roundtree of saying that Jesus could not perform a miracle and that somehow he's trying to rob Jesus of divinity. It's like the idea that Christ was forsaken on the cross. In one sense, he was I forsaken. literally quoted the Bible. Yeah, in another sense, he was not forsaken. What what Michael is clearly saying that in one sense, Christ could not perform this miracle because that's what the scripture says. But then in another sense, you go, he is God. He can do whatever he wants. It's like saying Jesus was hungry, right? Well, Jesus was hungry, but God isn't hungry. So you, you do have to take the whole corpus of scripture into context and go, Jesus truly humbled himself in the form of a human servant. Miller, mm -hmm. I want to tag you in, buddy. I'm sorry. Most of that was just Roundtree getting out there and me having to reel him back in. But uh, thanks for reeling me in. I want to tag you in. He was on a roll. It was. It was good. So let me. Something else I think is worth noting is the very attitude that question presents. Uh, this sort of prove it to me attitude. Um, that kind of attitude, Jesus very much condemned, uh, and he 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 addressed the Pharisees for the very same kind of attitude. That is not faith in a loving, benevolent God who Jesus is and represents. Um, that is a, I'll believe in you if you absolutely prove it to me and you owe it to me to do so. And I got to say, Jesus doesn't owe you anything. Uh, he doesn't have to prove anything to you, nor does the Holy Spirit have to prove anything to you when it comes to a gift of healing. Mm -hmm. Now, never mind the, the eisegetical problem that you're already presuming that the gift of healing works on command, which it clearly doesn't by example of the apostles who definitely saw people healed. Um, but the, the attitude itself needs to be a, uh, one, I think, repented of. Um, if you've mm -hmm. got that kind of prove it to me attitude, that is not confidence in somebody's goodness and character. Um, that is pride at its very core. And uh, I think that that's, um, I don't know, I, I, I think that's probably where a lot of people are coming from with those kind of things. We had somebody in the comment section last week on the video saying, if you've got the gift of healing, then come to this children's hospital and pray. And it's like, first off, nobody owes you anything and nobody needs to prove anything to you. However, I would be glad to do that. Fly me out there. If I have open reign to pray for people in a hospital, I'm in. I Amen. would love that. Yeah. Okay, guys, let's do that. Let's go to this next one. And uh, when Michael when Miller is saying, take me to the hospital, the, the claim is not, I will heal every person I pray for. The claim is that... I trust God, I believe God, and I want to pray for the sick, and I believe God heals the sick. I, not that 
he can force God to heal every person right. he prays for. And I think it's really important because what happened is there are guys out there like Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland who have really pushed a word of faith heresy that we can manipulate God. We can control what we want to uh, We can control God by the, the power of our speech. And if we have just enough faith, we can muster up a psychological certainty where our, our very will makes things come to pass. Um, that uh, is not the heart of a created creature at all. It certainly wasn't the heart of the apostles. Um, and, and it is a absolutely false and wrong approach to the gift of healing. Um, so we are coming at this from careful continuation as saying that is too far. Don't believe that and go there. These cessationists kind of come out saying that all charismatics believe that, which I would say that's actually the, the vast minority of charismatics believe that the, the vast majority of us have a theology of suffering that certainly needs to be fleshed out. Uh, and there's a there's a growing resurgence of careful continuationism that we want to push on. Uh, someone wanted to engage with Phil Johnson's quote, uh, Roundtree. I know you had some a passage there that you wanted to engage with. Oh, sure. Uh, here's a quote. He says, so this is Phil Johnson. Cessationism, cessationism is the view that certain miraculous gifts that stood as signs of an apostle, speaking in tongues, healing, prophecies, interpretation of tongues, gifts like that ceased with the apostles. Okay, well, I mean, that's fine. He's just stating what cessationism is. Uh, but this is, this even this idea, when he talks about signs of an apostle, he's referring to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, I'll read it to you in the NIV and the ESV, both, and you'll kind of see a little bit of the difference. Uh, NIV says, I persevered in demonstrating among you the marks of a true apostle, including signs, wonders, and miracles. So the NIV sounds like, uh, based on its... Uh, based on its translation with this word, including, sounds like signs, wonders, and miracles. These are part of the signs of an apostle. Hey, if you're an apostle, you do signs and wonders. And okay, so let's imagine that's what it says, but but would that really point to what a true apostle is, if that's what it means? Because lots of non-apostles also did signs and wonders. Uh, Philip does signs and wonders. Stephen does signs and wonders. I mean, we go on down to the book of Acts. We see people doing signs and wonders all the time. Um, and also in context, if you go back and read it, it's not talking about uh, apostles versus other Christians. It's talking about true apostles versus false apostles. And uh, so I like the ESV's rendering here better. It says the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. And so the the point there is that uh, is that like whatever those signs of an apostle were, they're accompanied by signs and wonders. The point is not that the signs of an apostle are specifically signs and wonders. Amen. And uh, and to Phil Johnson's point here, and let me just read again, certain miraculous gifts that stood as signs of apostle, like speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues, healing and prophecies, gifts like that. Where do we come up with a category of gifts like that? Where does the Bible say gifts like that? How do we decide? Well, just stuff that's super miracle-y like, you know, like, well, the Bible doesn't actually categorize so-called sign gifts versus non-sign gifts. That's nowhere in the Bible. So uh, the Bible just has gifts of the Holy Spirit. In fact, every gift of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, is a manifestation of the Spirit. So uh, it's it's just a, a categorization that I, I disagree with. And, uh, and I would say that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not to authenticate apostles. There is no unambiguous text in the New Testament that says signs and wonders existed to make sure that the apostles were trustworthy teachers of doctrine. And now that those 12 apostles are gone, we don't need signs and wonders now. Uh, to take another letter to the Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians, the spiritual gifts exist to edify the church. Does the church no longer need edification anymore? They had nothing to do there with signs of an apostle. Why would God say, you know what? Churches just don't need edification in those ways. We'll just limit the amount of those edifica the edification they need. You know, those in the Corinthian church, they really needed healing. Um, you know, they their bodies got sick and broken, but, you know, maybe in the 21st century, they don't need, you know, healing of anything anymore. Like, no, no, I'm not, I know a, a cessationist will affirm, and cessationists always come back with this, like, oh, well, we do believe in healing. Um and yes, we totally affirm cessationists believe in healing. Okay, so I, I'm not saying that, 
but you don't believe in gifts of healing and, uh, and you don't believe that these certain gifts, per, uh, continue. And that's what I'm talking about. Miller, uh, Josh, what do you guys think? You're, you're muted Miller. Thank you. Something else I was going to mention there is uh, a lot of the idea that these gifts had ceased. Uh, most of it probably comes from the Protestant Reformation. Um, in a book called uh, What's Wrong with Protestant Theology, John Mark Ruthven, who just passed, uh, documents pretty well how where this was birthed from. And in large part, it was to protect the idea of sola scriptura, that the scriptures are alone are authoritative. Um, and I think it's, I, I believe in that doctrine. And I understand why that, uh, why the cessation of the gifts argument was created to protect that doctrine. Uh, however, that, that protecting sola scriptura wouldn't necessarily, um, uh, why, why would you need to throw the gifts of healing out with that? I can understand the revelatory gifts. What do you guys think about that question? Uh, I, yeah. It's not just about, because I, I get, revelation threatening the scriptures if you think that prophetic words today are in the same authoritative level as scripture but why healing why throw that out i mean it, it, the assumption i believe is that like michael said earlier they're apostolic sign gifts that these things are overtly supernatural and if someone is performing these kinds of miracles we should listen to what they say so it's like a uh, but like that, a, that doesn't get rid of the problem that's the does argument. it no but I mean, if if somebody like uh, who's the guy who's had the the whole prophetic oh. dream about his uh, son, um, the name and all that, uh, Jeff Durbin. Is that oh, right? okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So why wouldn't that do the exact same thing? I mean, those kind of stories that he told. Why would people not think that he is specially anointed because of that miraculous work? Whether he had the gift of healing or had a prophetic gift or not, he was still having those kind of experiences. Should it not still do the same thing? So to say that you believe that the miraculous still happens today and then to, in the same breath, deny that the gift of miracles doesn't, it, the, the, the polemic is removed. There's no argument. It's the same thing in either case. Also, it's a, it's a huge category error because people will say, hey, God did this miracle, right, by giving people in Jeff's church these dreams. Now, we're not going to call that prophecy, even though the Bible calls it prophecy. We're not going to call it revelatory, even though the Bible calls it revelatory. And when his son came out healed, we're not going to call that the gift of healing. We're going to call that a miracle. So now we've called prophecies healing. We've called uh, uh, healing, um, or sorry, we've called prophecy a miracle. We've called healing a miracle, all because we have imposed upon the text of Scripture our categories that prevent us from believing that God heals and prophesies today. We were so yeah. we're so committed to minimalizing the supernatural power of God in our midst. Even when God performs supernatural miracles in our midst, we have to deny that they are what the Bible calls them in order to maintain our cessationism. And I, I don't think that that's a, a healthy way of approaching things. Because if you guys haven't heard the story, uh, there was a child who was going to be aborted. The the wonderful ministry at Apologia Church, brothers in Christ, are out there trying to save these babies, and they convince a mom not to abort their child. And in uh, uh, this situation, they're like, hey, we will adopt this baby. The church gets together and prays, you know, Lord, who is going to adopt this kid? Um, uh, Jeff thinks maybe this is our kid. Uh, his wife said something like, well, if we adopted him, we would probably name him Augustine. And then he said, yep, Augustine, we'd probably call him August. And then people from the church started coming to them saying, I think this is your kid and I think his name is August. Like God is speaking to people through dreams in this church. This 1689 cessationist church, which again, I'm not trying to minimize, oh, they have no faith because they're cessationists. Dude, they're out there doing the work, preaching the gospel. They're faithful witnesses. I, I'm by no means minimizing what God is doing. And in fact, I want to encourage, look, they're out there doing the work and God is supplying power to accomplish his mission by saving these children through a super, you want to call it miracles all day, go for it. Like just don't, don't ignore what God is doing. But I do think that those category errors are created so that the masses don't pursue prophecy, uh, which the Bible commands us to do. And they, they call us not to pursue gifts of healing, which the Bible commands us to do earnestly right. desire spiritual gifts, especially yeah. to prophesy. I I think the the scripture that they're going to use that they're going to go to is Ephesians two twenty, and Tom Schreiner calls this the. I mean, uh, it, I can't remember his exact language, but it's it's basically the literal foundation of cessationism, which ironically is a foundation. Ephesians two twenty that the uh, that the foundation of the temple, which is the church, 
that the that the temple is built upon the apostles and the prophets. And so Paul's, you know, talk uh, talking through this this sort of language, how the church is the typological fulfillment of the Old Testament temple. Uh, and so we're sort of the stones in the temple, but the and Christ is the cornerstone, but the foundation is the apostles and prophets. So the idea is, well, you needed apostles and prophets who were these, you know, miracle workers and seeing dreams and visions and, and doing all this healing. Okay, let's forget it that there were a whole lot of visions and a whole lot of healings that came from people who weren't apostles or prophets. But anyway, forget about all that. But these apostles and prophets, they were the foundation. But now that we have the foundation built, we don't need the stuff anymore. And so that's going to be how they argue. Like the church just kind of needed a good kickstart back in the day. But if you read that verse in context, it'll continue on into Ephesians 3, 5, and, uh, and the Apostle Paul will, will talk about, uh, he'll, he'll return to the, this language of apostles and prophets. And what's significant about them is that it was to the apostles and prophets, it's not just any prophecy they ever gave, uh, but the apostles and prophets were used to receive this mystery that had been previously hidden in all generations but is now revealed well what is that mystery it's the mystery that the gentiles are fully included within the people of god that they're not like proselytes coming in and sort of like becoming jewish which is how the jewish people imagined it that god was doing this whole new thing and creating what he calls in ephesians 2 i think it's verse 15 the new man jew and gentile together as the body of christ and so this is the foundation and, and, and that the apostles and prophets revealed. And that foundation doesn't need to be repeated. That revelation has been brought. But this has nothing to do with like miracles and signs and wonders and every revelation ever being part of that foundation. Uh, that, that's uh, actually absurdity in my mind. And, uh, and it violates the gr grammatical historical uh, interpretation, uh, uh, hermeneutic for understanding the Bible, uh, because there's no way there, you cannot tell me there is no way the apostle Paul is trying to teach in Ephesians chapter two twenty. if we want to get into the intention of the author, there's no way he's trying to teach like, Hey guys, the gifts are going to seize here real soon. So be paying attention. Like you have to actually pay attention. This, this is what awesome cessationists have taught us. Like, and I, and I actually mean that sincerely, like, they're, they're teaching us the grammatical historical rec, uh, uh, hermeneutic. They're, they're teaching like the, they've filled our seminaries uh, throughout the 20th century and into today. Like they've taught us great hermeneutics in lots of ways, but then they violate what they've taught us when they teach here that Paul's trying to teach cessationism. That's an importation. We're, There's no way he's quote, trying to teach cessationism. We're on quote two of 11. So we need to keep moving through this <laughs> list. Uh, I want to, I, I want to push through this one round uh, Miller cessationists have fallen out of favor uh, because the commitment to the authority of scrit scripture has fallen out of favor by Andy Woodard. Well, what do you think about that, uh, that statement there, Miller? <laughs> That's, that is, I'll be honest, there is not a single quote in this entire video that bothers me more than that one. But give me your, give me your take, Miller. Uh, well, prove it. Uh, I mean, again, it, it, you made a claim here that scripture has fallen out of, uh, has been, uh, the authority of scripture has fallen out of favor. Um, okay, with who? Uh, with the continuationist, um, because I don't see that happening. Um, no, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think there are, there is a, a failure to teach the scriptures expositorily in many charismatic churches. For sure. Um, but I think that's always been the case. And if anything, I think people are actually far more uh, serious about the scriptures than they were 700, 800 years ago. And God was doing miracles back then, too. There's lots of recorded miracles. So how is it any more so true today that the scriptures have fallen out of favor? Um, again, I, I'm thinking of the fact that we had a world that was largely illiterate and couldn't read the Bible. We didn't have the Gutenberg press. Suddenly the Protestant Reformation changed all of that. And I would say the scriptures are actually much more valued today than they were back then. Um, but I don't see less miracles, though, I, and I don't know how you prove that. If anything, I think Craig Keener has done a good job of documenting that we're seeing tons of the miraculous around the world and the gifts of healing, not less of them. So yeah. I, I just don't know where he's how he's validating that proposition. Like there's no uh, granted. We only got a little snippet there in that preview. And so I would be interested to watch the rest of the documentary. But I would say Andy Woodard. Uh, show me the proof there that 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 claim is not uh, accurate. In the same way that charismatics have weaponized the gifts of the spirit now to 
you know, empower bad leadership and don't touch the, the Lord's anointed. Um, it was doing that same thing during the Protestant Reformation. Roman Catholics were making these arguments like, hey, we're performing miracles and signs by these relics. Many of them, many of them were fabricated and false. And the, the, the Protestant Reformation responded by saying cessationism. Uh, starting with John Calvin, moving into Middleton, and then to B.B. Warfield, uh, they made the case, those are like the three waves of cessationism, if you will. But realize that cessationism um, is a relatively new invention. It's a relatively new doctrine. And it was a responding doctrine to the hyper-charismatic space. Cessationism exists, not because of sola scriptura. Cessationism exists because of hyper-charismatics. And... Yeah, exactly. um, Go ahead, Mill Roundtree. Uh, I was going to say, uh, far from cessationism has fallen out of favor because commitment to authority of Scripture has fallen out of favor, the only reason cessationism was ever in favor for a period of time is because the authority of Scripture wasn't taken seriously. Agreed. What do you do with 1 Corinthians 14, 1? Eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Cessationist, how are you going to obey that verse? Are you really going to say, well, that verse just doesn't mean what that verse says? Did God really put that verse in the Bible so that we could twist and turn the verse to mean, do not pursue prophecy or you're sinning, which is what many cessationists do? What do you do with that? Acts chapter 2 says the last days will be characterized by prophecy. We live in an age of prophecy. So, but for you, the last days apparently only means a few decades. All right. I know guys are giving me a hard time. I'm kind of going on rants today. So no, no, I'm, I'm going to stop it there. But, but that's that's one of those things where he goes, look, it's the commitment of Scripture that has caused us to pursue spiritual gifts and especially that we prophesy. That's right. Um, now, now uh, my brother has a very good point, and Miller touched on it. The charismatics have, by and large, become a movement, and th this is from charismatic history, right? Azusa Street happens, and the mainline churches throw rocks at them, and they're like, hey, we don't need your good book learning. We done doing the miracles now. We don't need none of that. <laughs> so we kind of created our own anti-intellectual movement. But again, That's true. Sin since recently, um, I, I would say look at the former presidents of the Evangelical Theological Society. You've got guys like D.A. Carson and Sam Storms. You've got guys like... Uh, 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 you know, Wayne Grudem. Wayne Grudem. You know, you've got Piper. You've got all these guys out there who ag agree. Again, you, you're going to disagree with all of them on some kind of theological issue somewhere. But but we have an army of biblically serious, sound theologians. The vast majority of seminaries right now staff both cessationist and continuationist. The, the idea that we're not biblically serious, I think, is a fallacious argument um, by and large. But I will give you I will say that does rightly apply to the hyper charismatic movement. Um, I'll agree with that. Okay. Well, let's at least this in next comparison one. to the continuationist movement. Yes. Yeah. 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 Hey, Miller, <laughs> yeah. you want to read that next quote? Sure. Number four. Uh, let me pull it up real quick. Okay. Uh, this is by Justin Peters. When you turn on Christian TV, you do not see expositors of scripture, John MacArthur or Steve Lawson. You see Joel Osteen, Joseph Prince, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, Joyce Meyer, Paula White, and that's you see because that is mainstream. What do you think? I mean, I got thoughts. Around you, you got thoughts, man. Uh, I do, but why don't you go, Josh? Because you worked in TV for a while. Yeah, I, oh, that's I worked. True. Yeah, I I worked at Daystar. Okay, <laughs> for one of so, those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I did web and graphic design before I started. I say before so, I started reading. So books. maybe that actually makes you lose credibility on this. Job. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might. It might. Uh, I said before I started reading books. Okay, so um, here here's the thing: uh, the TBN and Daystar were the only Christian television stations. Uh, that got national syndication, that got nationally popular, and they were started by word of faith, hyper charismatic people, uh, such as uh, the Crouches, was it Paul Crouch and Marcus Lamb started Daystar. So the idea that they're popular, they're mainstream, that's why they're on is silly, right? Um, the, the reformed community jumped onto YouTube really quick. And that's the reason that they're popular on YouTube is because they leveraged marketing well, and they knew how to get their message out there. Uh, you look at the Gospel Coalition. They dominated social media for a long time because they knew what they were doing and they tried to do it well. Um, the same thing happened because early adopters uh, jumped onto television and they happened to be Word of Faith. 
So if you want to jump on and, you know, pay Marcus Lamb a crap ton of money to spout cessationism, he's not going to let you do it because it undermines the the message that he and his friends are trying to put out. So I don't think the reason you see Joyce Meyer, you know, Kenneth Copeland, TD Jakes on there is because they're mainstream. In fact, I would say the vast majority of charismatic churches want nothing to do with those guys. Uh, that being said, there is an industry of uh, Christian industrial complex, if you will, out there that wants to get healed, wants to get wealthy, get, wants to get rich, and they want to make Jesus help you get there, right? Like, uh, that's something I think we all adhor. Um, I'm not for prosperity gospel. I hate it with every passion of my being. Uh, I think that the uh, word of faith movement is a movement that I resist with every fiber of my being. Um, you know, so all of those things, I'd say, hey, uh, there is a shred of an argumentation that you have there. But because someone knows how to leverage media is not the same as saying all of the church around the world that is charismatic, they're all listening to these three television stations. Bro, TV is dying. And I, I know that doesn't make any sense to Peters, but like my generation doesn't watch TV, right? Uh, the, the, the reason Benny Hinn isn't going to these big, massive conferences is because my generation doesn't want to hear from him. We don't want to hear about healthy, wealthy, and blessed. You just sound like a used car salesman to us. We don't want to listen to it. So even the charismatic among, amongst us, it, it's not fair to say that that's mainstream uh, because I think people are catching on. They've been growing up in these churches and they don't want anything to do with it. Uh, what, what are y'all's thoughts about this going forward? Uh, Roundtree, yeah, you got some thoughts? I, I think we can go to the next one because I, I think it's the same. I think our contention is if you're trying to come at continuationists, th this is, I mean, going after Benny Hinn and all the rest, like we go after them. Sure. regularly on the show try going after sam storms and jack deer and da carson and craig keener and some of these other guys it's a different conversation then because here we have theological precision we have well recognized exegetical skills we have presidents of the evangelical theological society carefully articulating their points and we have been who've actually documented and seen miracles all around the world and written books about it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages so Hey, Interact we've got Andy that, Woodward in the, the comment section right now, that comment that we were just responding to. He said, hey, uh, I was interviewed for an, uh, over an hour. Obviously, it's a sweeping general uh, generality. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, a quotable quote. Hey, Andy, we said that at the top of the show, you probably didn't see it earlier. We said these are edited clips that are one-liners that made the, the promo punchy. Uh, we tried to give you the benefit of the doubt at the top of the show. That quote bothered us, but Andy, we, we give you the benefit of the doubt at the top of the show. I appreciate you mentioning that, and I appreciate you making that clarification. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email, josh at theremnantradio.com, if you want to chat. We love talking to cessationists. Glad that you're we, engaging we with us in the comments section. We would bring you on the show to respond Easy. to some of our critiques. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. And, and we acknowledge these are one-liners. So in the same way, you can take a little bitty quote from Matt, you know, a Michael Roundtree that says Jesus couldn't heal. You know, you could take that quote and be like, look, Michael Roundtree's a heretic, um, you know, if you want to spin it a certain way. And, so, and I mean, again, that's what I, like I literally quoted Mark Six. Yeah, that's what I quoted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. I know. But there's still people Michael, who want to. Why are you denying the deity of Jesus? Jeez, Michael. Oh, my gosh. You know, <laughs> he is God, Michael. He, you can't say he can't anything. Okay. <laughs> so, but, but this is that same point that but, we you just you mentioned know a second Matthew ago. 13 says he would not. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Go for it. <laughs> so, so it, the, this, this, the fourth one that we talked about, Justin Peters just now, also realize that the Sam Storms, the Craig Keeners, the J.I. Pack, the, 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 the Packers, they're not on TBN either. They're not on, on Daystar either. So it's not like only charismatics these are the only charismatics we have it's that they're only platforming those kinds of charismatics so i think that's an important thing as well okay so uh question or question quote number five our understanding of speaking in tongues must be guided by the scriptures not our feelings that's gabriel amen. hughes we all say amen to that then there's another quote by someone else we'll tackle both of these at the same time uh, there were tongues known languages capable of interpretation and not everybody speaks in tongues I think we can amen, amen half of that. Amen. Yes, not everyone speaks in tongues. We agree. Do you guys agree with that one? I agree. Yeah, First Corinthians chapter twelve. So again, this is this is coming at it now. I I can't crawl into his head and understand precisely what he's trying to say, but like, um, it seems like he might not be aware that not every charismatic thinks the same on this. Agreed. There are those of more the Pentecostal tradition 
that see the baptism of the Holy Spirit as subsequent con to conversion, sometimes called second blessing theology. Like you later have an experience with the Holy Spirit where you're empowered and sanctified and all of these things and the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues that every believer can have is what issues forth from that. That's kind of one theology. The other side, sometimes called third wave, which would be everybody on this show, would be that we're all baptized in the Holy Spirit at the moment of conversion. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we were all baptized in one spirit into the body of Christ. So the baptism of the Spirit happens at the moment of conversion. And 1 Corinthians 12, 29 to 30 says, uh, I'll, it implies, and it's very clear, that not everybody does speak in tongues. So no, we don't see that as the initial physical evidence. All three of us do speak in tongues, but we never condemn anyone who doesn't because we all have different spiritual gifts. Yeah, all three of so us also have the gift of teaching, but that doesn't mean everyone has the gift of teaching, right? So we're cool with that. Uh, any, any, anything else we want to touch on that? That, that one seems to be Pentecostal specific. Uh, doesn't really apply to us. And anyone who's watched our videos on tongues recently will know where we stand on this. The idea of interpretation is always known languages. If interpretation is always known languages, then why is there a spiritual gift of interpretation? And in a metropolitan city where there's tons of languages being spoken, why does Paul say, if I speak in a tongues and no one understands me but God, it doesn't really make much sense that it would always be a known human language. We are giving room for the hyperbole that he says in, in verse 13, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. Um, we don't think that that's probable, but he does say in chapter 14 that only God understands him when he prays in tongues. So it makes sense that this would maybe a heavenly language of some kind, again, trying to acknowledge that chapter 13 is probably hyperbole speech. Um, and I think the three of us kind of digress on that. We disagree on little nuances at that point. Uh, but if you watch our other videos on tongues, you can get that, that gist. This is uh, quote number seven. I'll get you guys to respond to this. If God speaks, it must be infallible, inerrant, and authoritative. Jim Osman. Anybody wants to respond to Jim? Uh, I've been responding hey. in the chat section. I Amen. Lost. <laughs> You're all getting distracted. Yeah. yeah. If God yeah. speaks, God doesn't lie. God doesn't make mistakes. We believe the, in the inerrant and the authoritative and the all-sufficient word of God, the scripture. And the scripture always trumps any sort of prophetic revelation, which is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, if anyone is a prophet or thinks he is a prophet, let him acknowledge that what I'm saying to him is the Lord's command. The apostolic command trumps the so-called prophetic revelation. So uh, we're actually in agreement with this, but I think where the, the quote by Jim Osmond is really trying to get at when he says, if God speaks, it must be infallible and there inerrant and inerrant and authoritative, what he's trying to say is that when you speak prophetically for God, that you, if you're a true prophet, will always get it right. And, and that's where we would have a disagreement. We would say the revelation from God is always 100% accurate, but it can get muddled. And a good New Testament example of this is Acts 21, verse 4, where some people speak, quote, through the Spirit, telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem, where Paul has, in Acts 19, resolved in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. And in Acts 20, the Spirit has compelled him or constrained him to go to Jerusalem. Luke makes it clear that the Spirit has directed Paul to go to Jerusalem, and yet through the Spirit, uh, other prophetic people have said, don't go to Jerusalem. So who's right? Well, we have the, the repetition of the, the Acts 19 and 20 suggests that Paul was actually right. And at the end of the passage, they conclude the Lord's will be done. And so it seems that through the spirit, they told Paul not to go to Jerusalem must mean that the, the revelation itself did come from God, but they as messengers imperfectly related, it probably let their emotions get in the way. Uh, that's one example. We could give more examples and have given many on the show, uh, but but we believe there's evidence in the New Testament, both narrative as well as uh, in the epistles, uh, that true prophets could miss a prophecy without being labeled as a false prophet. Yeah, and if you're out there and you've made this movie cessationist and you're like, hey, I want to engage the best charismatic arguments on this, Sam Storms and Understanding Spiritual Gifts, uh, and Beginner's Guide to Prophecy, he addresses this. Wayne Grudem, uh, sorry, D.A. Carson in Showing the Spirit talks about how the contents of the prophetic word are being weighed, not the prophet themselves. Also, Wayne Grudem makes that case in the gift of prophecy in the New Testament. 
page 59, 61, and 69. Uh, Dr. Craig Keener responds to this in Gift and Giver. John Piper responds to this in a sermon in 2007 that I have to send you, but you have to email me for that. Uh, Andrew Wilson has an article on um, Sam Storm's blog. Uh, Jack Deere has a Beginner's Guide to Prophecy. All of these guys say God's revelation, if it came from God, is infallible and inerrant, um, but our understanding of that can be skewed in the same way that we can read the Holy Bible we believe the Bible is inerrant and infallible, but our comprehension or understanding of that transmission of inerrant scripture can be fallible. So the, the argument is kind of the same, that you cling to what is good and you reject what is evil, right? You test that prophetic word, not specifically that prophet. They make that case over and over. Uh, there's Apologetic Study Bible, ESV Study Bible, all these things also make that same case and I uh, would love to send you any of that content if you want to go through it. We've got, man, three or four more to go through, but it's... We can... Dude, let's pound them. In. You want to pound well, them, in? What do you think? Y'all want a part two or you want to pound through? Uh, I'd like to do a part two, but I'd also like to see if Andy would come on the show with us and have this conversation. So maybe we could I just go through it together. He might yeah, not be able to give his thoughts so. on it. <laughs> Well, that's yeah, true. like I said, my, my email is accessible, Andy, uh, Josh at the Remnant Radio. Uh, I mean, he, yeah. he's he's Wait. in here. He's like he's not a hyper cessationist guy. He believes that God does stuff. I mean, the thing is, I would love to work alongside um, guys like Jeff Durbin, who are cessationists or heck, uh, we did that episode on uh, what's the uh, Prince of Preaching. Why can't I think of his name? Spurgeon. Oh, Spurgeon. Sp Spurgeon was a cessationist, but the guy saw a crap ton of miracles and yeah you know, watch our gave, episode on spurgeon's healing ministry what would be the equivalent Nuts. of prophetic words all the time and and i i would want to work with those guys because they're faithful preachers of the gospel faith and repentance like preaching christ and him crucified christ exalted true gospel preaching that is accompanied by power that is sovereignly given by god that's the kind of charismatic mm -hmm. i want to be and if if there are cessationists out there who have different categories, man, I want to lock arms and partner with those guys and work with those guys too. The problem is that I would want to push those guys is that their cessationism causes others to neglect commands of scripture, like earnestly pursue the spiritual gifts, especially prophecy, right? Don't forbid speaking mm -hmm. in tongues. Um, you know, those kinds of verses, you know, uh, you know, Paul, I pray that you abound in every spiritual gift until the appearing of our Lord. Can you pray the prayers of Paul in scripture with a clear conscience. Um, I don't know. The cessationists can't, and that's unfortunate, um, but I'd love to continue these conversations and, uh, and engage with my brothers. And, and if you're out there and you watch the, you, you made the documentary and you want to engage with us as well, uh, the platform's open guys. We, 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 if you've watched any of our content, we judge prophetic words in the hyper charismatic movement. And we've had those guys come on the show. Uh, we're really open books. We love discussion and dialogue. So it, we really are open we're, to it. We're nice to cessationists. So if you made the, yeah. the documentary or if you were in the documentary, we'd love to have you on the show. Watch our interviews with Dr. Tom Schreiner on Amen. cessationism. You'll see. We love to be civil. We can sometimes get a little riled up when it's the three of us. Okay, I get a little riled up when it's the three of us talking. <laughs> yeah. But I was I was really fun. nice with that mute button, Michael. I didn't mute you one time in this whole <laughs> I know. Uh, awesome. Did, I I say let's save the last four for next week. Let's do a part two. Okay. So blessings, guys. Be blessed and highly flavored. Um, and if you're out there and you're a charismatic and you're like, man, what the heck? What is going on here? Uh, realize they're making these videos because there are excesses in our movement. We need to be careful. We need to be cautious. We need to be theological sound with the way that we're practicing the gifts. And if you're like, hey, how do I do that? I'd encourage you to check out the link in the description for the Word and Spirit School of Ministry. We have a training program where we're talking about the spiritual gifts, the gift of healing, the gift of prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, discernment, building a relationship with God, how the new age is trying to creep into the charismatic movement. We have to identify it, reject it. You know, uh, we, we do 117 videos. You watch a couple of videos. You uh, answer some questions, do some homework. You break out into live Q&A with your instructors. Uh, then we we gr break out into uh, small groups to discuss and practice what we've just talked about. Uh, it's an in-depth, charismatic discipleship program. So if you're out there and you're like, hey, I want to grow in my knowledge of God's word and the power of God's spirit, check out the link in the description. Uh, they're going like hotcakes, Michael. Going like hotcakes. And going like hotcakes. 117 say, videos, dude. I can't believe... We filmed that much, dude. That was some crazy filming. Every time I tell someone it's 117 videos, they're like, what? There's never been yeah. a course online that's 117 <laughs> videos. That's so ambitious. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's it's good. It'll edge it'll educate you. Yeah, you get so, that good that guys, good. Guys, check out that part two next week. And uh, and guys, Wednesday is our gifts of the spirit show. Uh, but we also do. I mean, Mondays is is just theology. Sometimes it's gifts, but it's usually something a little different. I can't even remember what we have this Monday. Josh, do you remember what we have coming up? Uh, well, this Monday we'll probably air because it's it's uh, Labor Day. We're probably going to air the video that I filmed on Old Earth Creationism with Dr. Ken Keithley. Uh, oh yeah, Rap Miller. That's an episode that you're gonna want to watch. He talks a lot about the worldview of the people writing scripture. And if their cosmology was different than ours, how are we to understand? Oh, I definitely you, you, want to I watch that. I promise you, that's your episode, man. We we talked about this a lot last week, so this would be a good episode. And he holds to inerrancy, so you'll 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 very much like that episode. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Okay, guys. Cool, guys. Blessings. See you next time. Bye, guys.